Thank you very much, uh, Zev, for the nice uh, introduction. Uh, so today I will not talk about brain imaging. This is a new area of research that, that we've started in the team uh, uh, on, on dirty data. And the reason we've started this is that, as we all know, data science is 80% of the time spending on preparing the data and 20% of the time spending complaining about the need to prepare the data. So let's address those 20% of the time. And really, the, the thing is, once again, uh, with the modern uh, machine learning tools such as uh, scikit-learn, machine learning is easy and fun, and we like to do it. But the problem is really getting the data into the learner. Uh, and industry surveys uh, show this. This was an industry survey by Kaggle a few years ago. And it asked, you know, what's the uh, uh, most blocking uh, aspect of running a data science project in your organization? Dirty data came on top, you know, above things like hiring the right uh, talent. Uh, so dirty data, so, you know, seeing this, we thought, well, let's, let's, let's tackle the problem. And when we thought let's tackle the problem, we didn't know what it meant. I'm not sure we know <laughs> these days. I guess everybody have, has their own uh, dirty data problem, but, uh, uh, but uh, at least we've understood a few things. And one thing that, that we've understood is that every machine learning research paper starts by let X a numerical matrix that lives in a, in a, a, a matrix space. And if, if we're going to implement this, it's going to be, well, you know, give me your data as an empire. And we've always said, you know, sure, you're going to have to transform your data uh, uh, from an, uh, we're, we're the kind of data you have to the empire, but that, that's your job, not us. So yes, in real life, the data Best case comes like this, often as a pandas data frame, so it's not exactly a, a numerical matrix. And uh, the first thing is that we can, uh, we will need to transform the different columns in different ways to cast this to a numerical array. And I, I want to talk a bit about the, uh, how to do this with with uh, scikit-learn because scikit-learn has gotten much uh, more pleasant in the last uh, few years to do this. But then we're going to hit a, a, a set of uh, uh, hard problems. And one of them is the fact that one of these columns is not a well-formatted categorical column. And for machine learning, it falls a bit between the cracks. And another one is that we might have missing values, and that also raises problems. So the outline of my talk is going to be that I'll talk a bit about uh, transforming columns with scikit-learn, and here I just want to emphasize a bit things that are feasible with modern scikit-learn and that can make your life easier, and this is just vanilla uh, scikit-learn. Then I'll talk about the problems of uh, dirty category, and this is more uh, uh, researchy talk, even though we do have software that you can use, and then I'll talk about the problems of uh, uh, learning with missing values, and this is more of a statistical talk, but there will be uh, uh, take-home messages. <coughs> so column transforming, the goal is to uh, start with panda data frames and come out with a well-formatted NumPy array that can easily be plugged in statistics such as uh, scikit-learn. So it's a pre-processing problem. So often, the way we get our data is we read it from a CSV file. So we could do this with pandas, and we'll get a data frame that has different types and different columns. And our goal is going to be to convert all those values to numerical values. And let's look at gender. So gender, we're, so it's a categorical column, and we're going to transform it to a numerical column. And the standard way to do this is to use one-hot encoding. So in scikit-learn, we'll use clearn.preprocessing.1hotencoder. And then we'll call the fit transform method on the column gender. And it's going to, to output indicator columns with zero and ones that indicate the different genders. OK? Now, for uh, dates, we could use the pandas date time support. So pandas deals quite well natively with, with this kind of uh, strings. It knows how to convert them to the date time object. And once we have the date time objects, we can take its value in float, and it's a value in, I believe, milliseconds to the epoch. And so it's a numerical value that is reasonably well ordered, and hopefully we can learn from it, hopefully. Uh, so 
<coughs> Something I'd like to stress is that in scikit-learn, we like to work with things that we call transformers. And if we look at the one hot encoder, we can actually split the uh, fitting of the one encoder and the transforming. The, the idea is that during the fitting, we're storing which categories are present in the data, and during the transforming, we're encoding this data accordingly. So this separation between fit and transforming is quite important because it avoids data leakage between uh, the train and the test set when we're evaluating the pipeline. And we can also store the fitted transformer and apply it to new data uh, at predict time uh, for production, for instance. And it can be used with a bunch of tools in scikit-learn, such as the pipeline or the uh, cross-valve score that is used to do a cross-validation. So for dates, uh, it might be useful to shoehorn our Panda uh, code into such a process. And for this, we can use the function transformer. So we can define a small function that will take as input uh, the uh, uh, Panda's data frame, or, or the Panda's column we're interested in, and then return as output a 2D uh, array of numerical values. And for this, it's just you know, taking the code that we were doing with pandas, putting it in the proper function, and making sure that we're returning a, a 2D uh, output. And then once we have this, we can use a sklearn.preprocessing.function transformer, give it this function, and uh, uh, tell it that we don't want validation, because if we want validation, it's going to try to check that the data is well formatted at the input, and it's not, so it will complain. So function transformer can be a bit more clever. You can tell it uh, how to inverse transform. It's a more, more sophisticated tool. And I, don't, I, I won't go into details. What I just want to stress here is that it can be useful to look at the modern pre-processing documentation of scikit-learn because it has many useful tools uh, for this uh, purpose. And once again, pipelines are good. Now, how do we put a pandas data frame in a pipeline? and apply different transformers to the different columns. Uh, for this, we can use uh, the column transformer object. The column transformer object will uh, uh, take a, a list of pairs of transformers and selectors of columns. And selectors of columns can be, for instance, column names. Okay. So here, with this code, I'm, I'm telling that I want to uh, apply a one-hot encoder to the gender an employee position title columns, and my date transformer to the date first hire. And now I can call the column transformer on a data frame. It will do all the magic and comes out an empire array. And so I can build complicated pipelines uh, uh, using this uh, kind of patterns to get my uh, raw data, at least my raw data frame, in, and then use scikit-learn on this. So this is useful for uh, uh, cross-validation, for instance. And uh, the benefit really is that we can use all the tools in scikit-learn for, uh, for model selection, uh, such as, for instance, we could pipeline this column transformer with a fast gradient boosting classifier that's new in, in O21, uh, and then just apply, apply cross-validation on the raw data. Okay? So uh, if you're not using it, you, you should probably be using it. If you think it can be improved, find an issue. <clears throat> now, if we do this on the example that I'm using, we're going to hit a problem. And the problem is with the employee position title. And really, the, 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 the reason is that there are many, many different entries uh, in this title. Uh, for 10,000 rows, there are 400 unique entries. So that will, uh, it will lead to a bunch of different problems, uh, and some of them are numerical. It's just going to take, well, computational, it's just going to take a lot of time to run, but some of them are statistical. And the reason they're statistical is that we might have some rare categories. There's only one instance of architect three in the data set. Uh, we might have some overlapping categories. We have different instances of police officers, and the link between those instances is not obvious as we, if we don't look at the, screen, the, the string content, and if we just look, consider these things as discrete categories. And 
Finally, it's a detail, but it's a real problem in practice. We might have new categories in the test set. So basically, one hot encoder doesn't work well at all with this kind of data. And sometimes we have this kind of data. So the standard practice to do this is to uh, use, to resort to data curation, cleaning your data. It can be seen, the, the, it's mostly techniques from database normalization. And so one thing that we could do is we could do feature engineering and we could try to separate the position from the rank and maybe we could separate the position, the rank and the department. Uh, so this would require us uh, 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 building rules uh, that we might apply in pandas on strings to separate those things out. The problem is it's going to take a little while to build those rules and, and they usually have to be uh, handcrafted. Another related problem, uh, for instance, in a different database here, we have a database where we have company names and we have the same company that's expressed under different names. Now that's a canonical problem of um, database uh, curation and it's known as deduplication or, or record linkage. And the goal being to output a clean database. Uh, basically to merge those different entries, those different entities, and represent them as the same entity. Uh, now this is quite difficult to do in general without supervision. You usually need an expert that shows uh, a set of mergers to have an algorithm learn how to do the mergers. And one problem is that it can be suboptimal because here, the, the, the data set here, the, the challenge is to detect fraud uh, with payments to doctors. And it's a real question on whether we should merge the Pfizer uh, uh, Hong Kong branch with the Pfizer Korean branch. Maybe they should be considered as the same entity and maybe not. That really depends on the question at hand. Uh, so the, the problem with this, with this view is that the goal is to output a clean database which is a, maybe, that may be a, a question specific uh, uh, point of view. What is a clean database? And in general, it's something super hard. So really these uh, things, all these IDs are hard to make automatic and to make turnkey. And I'd like to claim that they're much harder than supervised learning. Supervised learning, so supervised machine learning is, is a toolbox that works quite well as long as you have a supervision signal Database cleaning is a hard problem, and, and you will need a supervision signal, but that supervision signal is basically a clean database. So usually clean, database cleaning, you first have somebody clean part of the database, then you learn rule from this, and then you clean the rest of the database. So our goal here is not database cleaning, it's working directly on the dirty data and doing good machine learning on the dirty data. Really the point being that the statistical questions, so the supervised learning problem should inform the curation. And ideally, we should even curate. So the first work we did with uh, Patricio Cerda, uh, uh, I, I should stress that this part is really the work of Patricio Cerda, who's doing a PhD in, uh, in my group. So the first thing that we did is that we took one hot encoding and we relaxed it. And basically, instead of having zeros and ones, we added string distances between the representations of the, of the categories, and we encoded with string distances instead of zeros and one. And that really tackles the problem of new categories in the test set, because if there's a new category in the test set that's not represented in the train set, I can just look at the string distances to the categories in the, tr in the, in the train set. And it also allows us to link categories. If, for instance, I have typos, in my columns, which is something that does happen, the typos are going to give me very small string distances, and those two columns are going to look very similar. So there are different string similarities that we could be using. Maybe the most well-known one is the Levenstein distance. The Levenstein distance is basically the number of edits that we need to do to one string to match the other. And it's really a classic one. There's the Jarrah-Wilkler distance, it's the number of matching characters renormalized by the number of transpositions, character transpositions. It's well used in, in, the, in the database community. And there's what I call the n-gram or jacquard similarity. If we define n-gram as a group of n consecutive characters, 
So for instance, if I have London, the first n-gram will be L-O-N, the second n-gram will be O-N-D, the third n-gram N-D-O. So we're basically taking all those n-grams, here these are three grams, we're taking all the three grams, and then to compute the distance between two strings, we're looking at the number of n-grams in common between the two strings, and the number of n-grams divided by the number of n-grams total, okay? So if the two strings are the same, they have all the n-grams in common, so this is one, so this is a, a similarity. If they're completely different, they have no n-gram in common, so this is zero, okay? Um, so these are three classic string similarities. <coughs> so be, because this is a Python conference, we're giving you a Python implementation. Uh, we have this software that we call Dirty Cat for dirty category, and it allows me to put pictures of cats on my slides. Uh, it's crucial. It's available uh, online, BSD license and everything. Uh, it's something in between a research quality software and a production quality software. Uh, I, I think it's reasonably good quality. It's not as high quality as Scikit-Learn, but it comes with documentation, examples, and everything, you can, you can look at it. It also comes with um, example data sets. And it provides uh, similarity encoding. So similarity encoder is just an encoder. It will work like scikit-learn. You can instantiate it saying which similarity you want to use, and then you can transform the column of the data frame or the data frame you're interested in transforming. So it's a drop-in replacement for one hot encoding in scikit-learn. Now, I'll show you how it performs on real data, but before I show you how it performs in real data, let me present another approach that is, um, it's been around for quite a while. That's called target encoder. It's not known well enough. Uh, the idea being that we're going to represent each category by the average target. So for instance, we're going to represent the police officer three by the average salary of the police officer three in our database if we're trying to predict the salary, right? So this gives us a 1D representation of all the, all the categories. I've, I've shown it here. So all our categories are embedded in, in one dimensional, which is the average salary. So we have the average salary. And so you can see that in the database, the person who makes the least amount of money is the crossing guard. And the person who makes the most amount of money is the manager three, manager two, actually. So by the way, this is maybe a bit surprising. The order in managers doesn't make sense, right? We have manager three, who makes less money than manager one, who makes less money than manager two. Why is that? Because those are average salaries. And we might have people with different level of experience, or I don't know what. It also is telling us that this signal is not a perfect signal. It's a noisy signal, this, this embedding. But it's useful because it's embedding all the categories close by when they have the same link to Y. So that's helping us build a simple decision function to do prediction from this representation, okay? Now, this is, it, it comes with drawbacks. The first one is it doesn't know how to deal with a new category. If I tell you a category, if I give you a category that I've never seen, I don't know the average salary, I can't represent it. So I can, I can represent it by the average salary of everybody, but that's losing a bit of information. And the other thing is it's absolutely not using the string structure of the category. So typos, for instance, it, it will not find the links between typos unless it sees enough of those typos to see that they basically link to the, the, the target in the same way. So I'd like to say really that it's a complementary approach to our approach. It takes a different point of view uh, and is, is very interesting too. <laughs> it's also available in Dirty Cat because our goal in Dirty Cat is not to sell the methods that we develop but to help solve a problem, which is Dirty Categories. And so it's target encoder, oops, and I was editing this too late yesterday evening, and target encoder does not take a similarity uh, um, argument. So Patricia Serda uh, did um, um, a numerical benchmarks on uh, real life data sets uh, here using seven real life data sets to compare the different approaches and uh, 
we benchmark linear models in gradient boosted trees. And what I'm showing you here is the average rank of the different methods across the different data sets. So one would be that the method was always the best predictor across all the data sets. And so what you can see, and we, so there's more in the paper, uh, we benchmark many other methods, but I'm really giving the executive summary because many of the methods that we benchmarked were not helpful. Um, so what you can see is that target encoder helps, uh, so with gradient boosted trees, it helps compare to what hot encoding. Uh, one thing that, that is not visible in those numbers is that gradient boosted trees do much better than linear models. So I would advise you to focus on gradient boosted trees in practice. They're uh, much more useful for this kind of data set. So target encoding helps a lot. And then in the similarity encoding, what we found is that the three gram distance, the three gram similarity was really the most helpful. And the others are not, most, not as helpful. So our take home message is really we can focus on similarity encoding with three gram distance. And though might, it might be useful, for instance, to build a, a pipeline that stacks both a target encoding and similarity encoding because these two objects capture different information in the data. And that's easy to do, by the way, with a column transform. You just select the column twice and, 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 and send it in, in the two different uh, uh, encoders. Okay, now in practice, uh, we're gonna hit a problem is that in many, though not all databases, the number of different categories uh, grows with the amount of data. Here, that's the, that's the second work that uh, uh, we did with Patricio, and we're, now we've moved, we've gathered more data sets, and now we've moved to 17 data sets. It's actually hard to find data sets that are not curated and with an open license. People do not like to share their non-curated data set. So please, please do share your non-curated data set. That's the only way we can develop better methods. So, so what you're seeing here is that across many data sets, as we increase the number of row, the number of different entries that we're seeing in a given column increases and increases sometimes very fast, sometimes only slightly fast, but it, it gives a problem because it means that if we're going to use uh, the, the um, similarity encoder, uh, we're gonna blow up the dimension and we're gonna end up running gradient boosting on things that have 100,000 features, which is not only bad statistically, but also will take a lot of time. So really the, oh and yeah, so there's, this is, um, this is related to problems in, in, for instance, natural language processing, where as the corpus of the text go, gets bigger, the number of different words that we see keeps increasing. So in, it's, it's quite related to classical natural language processing problems. So, we need to tackle this, elsewhere we can't give this to you as a turnkey method that you can apply to large databases. Uh, so both similarity encoding and one-hot encoding are prototype methods. What I mean by prototype method is that they compare the uh, data to a set of prototypes and by default it's the, all the prototypes on the, on the training set. The challenge now is to choose a small number of prototypes to be able to scale. So we can take all the training set, that's what we're taking by default, it blows up. We can take the most frequent, uh, but it's a strategy that's easy to game. You can easily have a data set that breaks the strategy. And one of the problems is that the most natural prototypes may not be in the, the training set. For instance, if my training set is made of big cat, fat cat, big dog, fat dog, I probably want to break this in big and fat and cat and dog. And none of these original entries actually have uh, the right terms. Okay, so I need basically to break down my, uh, my categories. So now I'll tell you how we estimate those prototypes. 
And the, the thing that is going to save us is that when those, those different strings grow, they have common information. Here I'm showing you the growth in the number of three grams as I increase the number of strings. And what you can see is that it's a smaller growth than the number of different strings. And this makes sense because, for instance, if this uh, dirtiness, this diversity of the string is made uh, uh, from typos, uh, then typos actually modify a small fraction of the string. So yes, I will, I will have new three grams, but most of the three grams will be in common. In practice, if I look at my data sets, you can really clearly see this, that the, the substrings are in common. For instance, in this drug name uh, data set, I can see that I have many different versions of alcohol, but they're all versions of alcohol, so there's alcohol in common everywhere. In my employee salary problem, I have substrings that are really meaningful. Police is in common, officer is in common, technician, senior. So the challenge is going to grab this information and capture those meaningful substrings. And for this, we're going to use techniques from topic modeling in, um, in natural uh, uh, language processing. And we're going to apply topic modeling on substrings. So what we're going to do is that we're going to represent all the, all the strings as their substrings using an n-gram representation. And here I've shown a three-gram representation, but in practice, we're, we're doing a bit, something slightly more sophisticated than this. We're taking the two grams, the three grams, the four grams, and also the words that we've split with a set of uh, separator, uh, 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 separating characters that uh, uh, we have default values, but you can change them. Uh, so then we build a big matrix that represents uh, each entry by its uh, uh, substrings, and then we apply matrix factorization on this, Really matrix factorization, what it's doing here is uh, to say, um, I, will, I will separate this matrix in two matrices. One matrix that is what I call the descriptions of the latent categories, and it tells me what substrings are present in a latent category. And another matrix, which is what latent categories are present in a given entry. Okay, so I've, I'm really factorizing in the description of latent categories, categories that I'm inferring from the data, or prototypes, and how those are expressed in the data. So to give you an example of um, the result, this is, and, and so by the way, we're using the activation, we're using the activation matrix, so the, the one that expresses which categories are, which latent categories are in an entry, we're using this to represent the data. And so this is what I'm showing here. These are those employee salary, the employee position titles. And this is, and I've, I've run the, the model with a dimensionality of eight. And this is the loadings that are showed. So what you can, you, if you squint your eyes, what you can uh, see here is that it has detected something like a technician, uh, like um, legal, police, it has detected those substrings, okay? And so one thing that I'm not showing here that I, I should be is that we're using a heuristic to give a name to those columns, and the name is really what's the th what are the three words that are most represented in those columns. So this is useful because it gives you, it's giving you feature names. We're encoding this with feature names. And so if we compare it to a similarity encoder, it's much more uh, marked, much more present much more interpretable. And then we can uh, do data science, interpretable data science, and for instance, we can look at permutation importances of uh, gradient-boosted trees, for instance, with the, uh, string, with the categories that were inferred from the data. And uh, this is what I get here. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is that I've inferred from this messy data, I've inferred latent categories, uh, that makes sense, and on which I can do an analysis and present it to you. And it also, by the way, predicts well. In the paper, we're showing that it gives you good prediction. Okay? So you don't have to clean your data anymore. So now I want to talk about one last thing, which is learning with missing values. So we've dealt with this non-formatted categorical data, and now we need to deal with the fact that some of our values are missing. <clears throat> 
And so why doesn't the bloody machine learning toolkit work on this? There is a fundamental reason is that machine learning models in general tend to need entries in a vector space or at least a metric space or at least an ordered space. It's just easier for machine learning to draw analogies if it knows links between data and missing value is nowhere there. So it's slightly more than an implementation problem. There is a, a fundamental problem there. There is a very, very advanced and thorough literature on uh, missing values in statistics. And let me summarize it really quickly for you. The canonical model is that we have a, a generating process for the complete data and B, a random process that occludes the entries. This is really the conceptual model on which the classic results uh, uh, stand upon. And then there's a really classic uh, situation which is known as missing at random, MAR, that says, hand-waving, that for non-observed values, the probability of missingness does not depend on the non-observed value. This, this might seem a bit mind-blowing. If you look at the actual definition, it's even more mind-blowing. And people simplify it uh, because it doesn't really make sense. And it's true. It doesn't really make sense. The reason there is this definition is that it allows in a likelihood framework to prove that, and that was proven by Rubin 40 years ago, that maximizing the likelihood of the observed data while ignoring marginalizing in technical term, the unobserved value will give the maximum likelihood of model A, of the model of the complete gener data generative process. Okay? So it means that if you are modeling your data, if you're doing classic statistics, you're modeling your data with likelihood models that you believe, and you believe you have an including process, you can still do the, you can still solve the problem when you're in a missing at random situation. Conversely, if you're so, and missing completely at random is a special case of this situation where the missingness is independent from the data and it's an easier, so it's a special case of missing at random and it's easier to understand. And the theorem still applies. Now, conversely, if you're in a missing not at random, if you're not in this situation, then missingness is not ignorable. If you try to maximize the likelihood while ignoring the missing data, you will have problems. In practice, what does it look like? I've shown you a complete data. I've show, shown you a missing completely at random. So basically, I've subsampled. So here, I'm, I'm deleting my missing values. They're not on the data set. So I've subsampled. It's a problem. And I'm, missing, I'm showing you missing not at random. And what you're seeing here is that we have some form of censoring process. And part of the, the, the data distribution is not well represented. OK? So this will give problem. Now, I would like to say that this classic statistical point of view is not of interest to us here, or at least not completely of interest. And we shouldn't take those results as fundamental results for machine learning. There are two reasons. One is there is not always a non-observed value. For instance, what, the, what is the age of the spouse of people who are single? So e even this assumption is broken in many, many, many data sets. And the second one is that we're not trying to maximize likelihoods, we're trying to predict. Now, based on this, we can just do machine learning. But the bloody machine learning toolkit still doesn't work. I've given you theory, not practice. OK, practice. I'll come back to this theory later. Practice. We can impute. And this goes back to the theory before. Imputing means we're going to fill in the information. We're going to guess things for those values we haven't seen. And once again, there's a large statistical literature, but it's focused on in-sample testing. Doesn't tell you how to complete the test set, and doesn't tell you what to do with the prediction. So let me cover a bit the tools we have in scikit-learn. There is mean imputation, which is a special case of univariate imputation. And we can, for instance, replace the missing values with the mean of the feature. So this is done with uh, the simple imputer. There is conditional imputation. The idea being that you're modeling one feature as a function of the other, and then you can learn predictive models across features, uh, and then uh, you can predict missing values, OK? Uh, there are classic implementations in R, and we now have an, an, an implementation 
in a second learn that can do this with linear models or random forests or other things. The classic point of view tells you that missing, that mean imputation is a very, very, very bad thing because it will distort the, the, the distribution. So as you can see here, I've imputed the missing data with the mean, and you can see that we're collapsing the variance of the data along one direction. So we shouldn't be doing that. Classic point of view. And there are conditions that are known as con congeniality conditions on an imputation that tell you that a good imputation must, must, must preserve the data properties used by the later analysis steps. Now, we've looked at supervised learning in this setting, and we've shown, we've proven that if the learner is powerful enough, like a random forest or a gradient boosted tree, imputing both the test and the train with the mean of the train is consistent in the sense that it converges to the best possible prediction. And the reason is, A, we're not trying to maximize likelihoods, B, the learner will learn to recognize the imputed entries and will comp compensate for them. So the learner basically learns those biases in the distribution and fixes them. So we don't have to worry about the classical results. In practice, you can see it here. I'm comparing mean imputation and iterative imputation, and what we can see is that if I have enough data, they perform as well. If I don't have enough data, then the iterative imputer is better. The notebooks are online, and the slides are online. So the conclusion is when we have enough data, Iterative imputer is not, is not necessary. Mean imputation is enough, but when we don't have enough data, iterative imputer helps. Now, it may not be enough. Imputation may not be enough. Uh, and here's a pathological example. Why what I'm trying to predict depends only on whether the data is missing or not. Suppose I'm trying to predict fraud, and the only signal about fraud is that people have not filled in some information. Uh, so this, this will fall into missing not at random situations. And in such a situation, imputing makes the prediction impossible. Okay? So if I impute, I'm uh, 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 losing this information, and uh, I can't predict anymore. So what's the solution? The solution is to add a missingness indicator, an extra column that tells me whether or not the data was present, so I can impute, but also expose to the learner whether or not the data was present. And if I do this, so this is, this is another simulation where we have specific censoring in the data, and if I do this, what you can see is that both the mean and the uh, iterative imputer are consistent. They converge with, to, the, to the best prediction. If there is the indicator, but the iterative imputer doesn't work well at all if there is not the uh, uh, indicator. And also what we can see is that here, so adding this, this indicator, this mask, is absolutely crucial. And the other thing that we can see is that iterative imputation in this situation is actually detrimental because it's making it harder for the learner to see this missingness pattern. All right? So basically we have two situations. One where the missingness is not informative, in which case the, the iterative imputer is better. One where missingness is informative, in which case actually iterative imputer can harm because it makes it harder for the learner to learn this, this informative missingness. Okay? Now, to wrap up, learning on dirty data, first take home message prepare the data via column transformer. That's easy. Second take home message, Use gradient boosting. In my experience, it really works well on this kind of data. It's robust to all kind of word entries in the data. First thing you should try, probably. <laughs> Dirty categories. So we're interested in statistical modeling on non-curated categorical data. Please help us and give us your dirty data with a prediction task. It helps us benchmark what we do. It's very important. And we have similarity encoding and more work that's coming up really soon. Supervised learning with missing data, mean imputation with a missing indicator is actually a pretty good choice. There are many more results in the paper. And in general, if you're interested in this area of research, we have this research project that we call Dirty Data, where there is ongoing research and there will be more. Thank you. Thank you, Gael.
Uh, we have five minutes for questions. Uh, please come to the microphones in the aisles. Um, thanks. Liked the talk a lot. Um, a little bit, uh, uh, maybe not the best question for Europe Python. Um, is there a, a version of Dirty Cat also for R? And if not, um, do you think it would be easy to port it? Dirty Cat should be fairly easy to code. The, well, Dirty Cat. Dirty Cat is several things, and it will grow. But both target encoding, so target encoding, the implementation, one of our colleagues, Joris van den Bosch, who's also a Pandas developer, found that there was a better way to do target encoding, so we're going to fix this. We're going to improve target encoding. Um, but both target encoding and similarity encoding are fairly easy to code. Code the ngram version for similarity encoding. Don't bother about the other ones. Uh, but yeah, please do it. Go ahead. Uh, there's one in, in, in Spark. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is why three? Why the n-gram number three? Is, did you test other numbers or is three the golden standard and everyone should use? No, three was more for didactic reason. In practice, what we're using in these days is the two, the three, the four, and, and the substrings that are s separated by spe specific characters such as spaces. And this we did benchmark, but we only have 17 data sets. So our benchmarks are not fully trustworthy. We need more benchmarks, to no, more data sets to do more benchmarks. Yeah. And the uh, second question is, what if you have missing data in the dirty category? What if you do not know if it's a police officer or a janitor or something? Good question, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, I should have mentioned this. So. My, my, my missing data is more a problem for continuous values. For categorical value, I would advise in general to basically just add an, an, an indicator to represent uh, the, the missing value as a specific value in your encoding, which could be 0, 0, 0, 0, by the way. Thank you. Hi. Uh, very interesting talk, uh, practical as well, thanks. Uh, do you have a plan to look into active learning at some point as well? I mean, I think on, on uh, real-world problems that might be interesting. This is not our research agenda. Our research agenda is to put the human out of the loop. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is true that active learning for database curation is extremely useful, and it probably complements what we're doing. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Please give a round of applause to Gael. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.